A ranger executive was once asked to estimate how dangerous a grizzly bear was. He said, imagine a danger scale from one to 10. Zero is a butterfly and 10 is a rattlesnake. A grizzly is somewhere between zero and one. There have been some pretty good ideas throughout human history, and one of them is the National Park. Yellowstone, established in 1872, was the first national park in the United States, and often considered the world's first, though Bogut Khan Ul National Park was protected by the Mongolian government in 1783. Yellowstone was founded for the enjoyment of nature and to conserve the wilderness. While the idea of preserving nature is a nice idea, it was a bad idea to forcibly deter Native Americans from entering and using the park. It was also a bad idea to forcibly relocate the tribes from their home in Yellowstone and move them to nearby reservations. Yellowstone may have been the first, at least in the US, but it certainly wasn't the last. More parks would follow, and in 1910, President Taft signed the bill establishing Glacier as the country's 10th national park, located in northwestern Montana on the Canada-United States border. It encompasses over 1 million acres, or over 1,500 square miles. It has mountain ranges, over 100 lakes, and of course, a wide variety of plant and animal species. Glacier National Park is home to 71 species of mammals, from the tiny pygmy shrew to larger animals, like the goats, elk, mountain lions, and of course, bears. There is the black bear and the larger grizzly bear. The grizzly bear is so named because its hair is grizzled or silver tipped. Yet the name is sometimes believed to be derived from grizzly, meaning horrible. Glacier National Park is one of the few last refuges of the grizzly in the lower 48. They used to range from northern Alaska to central Mexico, from the west coast to the Great Plains. But between 1850 and 1970, grizzlies were eliminated from 98% of their original range. Populations plummeted from an estimated high of 50,000 to between 1,500 and 1,700 today. The grizzlies in the lower 48 aren't the largest of the brown bears, but they are still significantly big. According to the US Fish and Wildlife Service, adult males average 400 to 600 pounds, and adult females average 250 to 350 pounds. One of the largest grizzlies on record in the state of Montana is the Lincoln grizzly. Killed by a vehicle in 2007, the male weighed about 830 pounds and stood around eight foot tall. The speed of the grizzly is usually put at somewhere between 30 to 40 miles per hour, with the National Park Service putting their max speed at about 35 miles per hour. The hearing is over twice the sensitivity of human beings and exceeds human frequency ranges. They have a powerful sense of smell. While we are not sure of the exact limits, their nasal mucosa area is about 100 times larger than in humans. I've read in some older books that bears have poor vision, but in more recent years, this seems to have been somewhat debunked, with most sources now saying they have comparable vision to humans, though according to bear.org, their distance vision, over 200 yards, has not been tested. And perhaps, most importantly of all, bears are quite curious and intelligent. They have a large brain compared to body size and have strong navigation skills and an excellent long-term memory. Big, strong, powerful animals that fortunately rarely attack humans. Though, logically speaking, if you have more human-bear interactions, there will of course be more opportunity for attacks. In the early days of Glacier National Park, visitors were few, and they were usually brought by outfitters with horses and mules. By the 1960s, the park had gotten more popular. It was no longer necessary to travel with outfitters. There was now an extensive 700-mile trail system, and backpacking and camping was becoming a lot more popular to do, thanks to the cheaper and lighter equipment. Almost a million people visited Glacier National Park in the summer of 1967. That's a lot of people in bear country, but again, attacks from grizzlies were extremely rare. And at the time, they even had the records to prove it. At the beginning of the summer of 1967, Glacier National Park could accurately boast that there had never been a single death. In the early summer of 1967, Don and Joan Berry, along with their three children, went to stay in Glacier National Park at a place called Kelly's Camp. 
which was 12 log cabins by the western shore of Lake MacDonald. They had spent many summers here and were used to the local flora and fauna. In the middle of June, Joan looked out the back window of the cabin towards an area where there were garbage cans and she saw a bear. She knew right away it was a grizzly. She had seen them before and could see all the identifiers like the big hump behind its head. But something was off about this bear. Its hair was patchy and thin. The bear itself, though having a big frame, was also quite thin, somewhat emaciated. It had unusually long claws, suggesting it was not using them to dig up roots. It also had an oddly shaped head. Joan Berry concluded it was a sick bear that was clinging onto life from finding scraps and eating garbage. She mentioned it to a ranger friend, but no one was particularly concerned. Every now and then you'd see a grizzly around Kelly's camp, and no one had ever been killed by a grizzly in the park. Joan continued to see the grizzly though, and not only did it look weird, it also acted strangely. Every few days it would visit the garbage cans and sometimes eat out of them in broad daylight. Now and then it would fly into a fit of rage and throw the garbage cans around and then all of a sudden would be calm. A few times Mrs. Berry tried to make noise to scare the grizzly away. Usually bears flee at the first sign of humans with some exceptions of course, like a sow with her cubs, but usually a lone grizzly would flee. Not this grizzly. When it heard the noise, it stood up and took a few steps towards the sound. The family decided the best thing they could do when the bear was spotted was to stay inside and be quiet. But sometimes staying quiet was easier said than done. The family had a dog, a German short-haired pointer. If the bear was spotted behind the house of the garbage cans, Joan would bring the dog into another room where it couldn't see the bear out of any of the windows. However, one night, Joan was asleep in bed and the dog was in the kitchen. The kitchen was facing towards the backyard and through the garbage cans and the bear came. The dog started barking and Joan rushed down into the kitchen to grab the dog. She did and then a loud thud as the bear slammed into the back door. The door held. The bear slammed into it again. The door continued to hold, and then, nothing. Joan moved the dog to a different room. She then went back into the kitchen, and peering out the window, she saw the bear feasting on the trash from the garbage cans. It had seemingly forgotten about the dog. It was not the only time the bear attacked the house. It came to a point where, if the bear was around, they would try and stay still and quiet, and not walk past any windows, because if they did, the bear would slam into the side of the house, sending ornaments and decorations flying across the room. The bear frightened others around the camp as well, one time approaching an outdoor birthday party until a bench was thrown at it. On other occasions, warning shots were fired at it, but it kept coming back to the camp. Rangers were called on multiple occasions, but usually the sound of the engine as they approached was enough to scare the bear off. And the rangers didn't seem to think there was anything to worry about. Apparently, one even laughed at Joan when she told him something needed to be done about the bear. Joan was very frustrated by this, especially since in all the years she and her family had been coming to the park, they never once had reported a grizzly before. The other people at the camp, like Joan, thought there was something wrong with the bear. With the large frame and thin build, it had lost its fear of humans and was becoming bolder and bolder. The bear had reportedly visited Kelly's camp 15 times but then, one day in early August, a ranger came to the camp and told everyone that they wouldn't be having any more trouble with the bear and that the bear had moved on to Trout Lake. Trout Lake was an area that had a high amount of grizzly sightings. It wasn't just the lake itself that attracted the grizzlies, but the abundance of berries around the lake. On one occasion, three hikers claimed to have seen five grizzlies in a row. The Kelly's Camp Bear, I guess now the Trout Lake Bear, was causing problems with multiple complaints from campers at Trout Lake. On August 4th, there was an article in the Hungry Horse News with the title, Encounter Bear at Trout Lake, a piece about two young boys who had a narrow escape from the bear and were luckily fine. Years later, a High Park official said someone should have brought the article to his attention. About eight miles away from Trout Lake is a place called Granite Park Chalet, a two-story log building that has been in the park since 1915, and it's still there today. In summer of 1967, a husband and wife by the names of Tom and Nancy Walton were put in charge of running the chalet. They didn't really have much experience in such a job. 
They were in their early 20s, and Tom had previously been a firefighter, but the pay was reasonable, and they got to be together. There were other staff that were working at the chalet too, a Mrs. Eileen Anderson, and a few other younger women. There was a lot to do to get the chalet ready for guests, cleaning, making beds, digging out a water system, and it was during the chores Tom noticed something that seemed to be a mistake. The incinerator. It was too small. It could barely burn the garbage from the crew of ten. It would not be able to burn all the garbage that came along when the guests arrived. There was a gully behind the chalet where they could dump garbage. They were told it was okay to dump some garbage there, just not too much, as they didn't want to attract the grizzlies. In the first few days of getting the chalet ready, they didn't see any bears, and Tom remarked to one of the staff, maybe they're not going to show up this summer, to which the person replied, oh that would be awful. There, our main drawing card. A few nights passed without any sign of a grizzly, and then, one night, a loud bang from outside. Tom ran downstairs and looked out the front door with a flashlight. About 20 yards in front of him was a grizzly looking back. He slammed the door shut and yelled through the chalet, Don't go outside, there's a grizzly out there. And then, a bunch of staff ran outside, trying to see the bear. Fortunately, it had already been scared off. Tom was confused by the reaction of the staff, but was beginning to understand just how badly people wanted to see grizzlies. For the next few nights, no one saw grizzlies, but they saw a sign of the bears. There were tracks around the chalet, most mornings of multiple bears, including an adult with some cubs. Some of the more experienced staff explained to the Waltons that bears would frequent the chalet looking for scraps of food and trash. As July rolled in, so did the visitors and their leftovers. The small incinerator could not handle all the trash. Tom attempted to use a 50 gallon drum to burn the garbage, but each morning he found the bears had knocked over the drum to eat the leftover unburned food. He discussed the problems with his boss, and it was decided that they would start using the area behind the chalet to dump all the garbage, and the bears loved that. A variety of different bears showed up, but two regulars emerged. Two bears nicknamed Number One and Number Two. The two bears would sometimes snarl and growl at each other, and one time, when some spoiled bacon was thrown out with the rest of the trash, the two bears fought, which the visitors loved to watch. In fact, the chalet was packed to max capacity of 65 people every night, and a lot, if not most of them, seemed to be coming to see the grizzlies. Tom learned that for decades, these bear shows had been taking place at the chalet. A few times, Tom even decided to purposefully add a little extra meat to the day's garbage so that the visitors would get to see the bears fight at night. Many times rangers came with tour groups and enjoyed watching the bears and never said anything about it, except for one high-ranking official who told Tom, don't feed those bears, use the incinerator we got you. But Tom didn't take the order very seriously and Tom's boss and other experienced workers at the chalet told him there was nothing to worry about and to keep putting the scraps out. Their reasoning being, they didn't know what to do with all the extra garbage, and neither did the park service. That's not to say Tom wasn't a little on edge. On multiple occasions he caught people trying to sneak down to get a closer look at the bears, and when Tom caught them, he yelled at them, saying that the grizzlies were too dangerous. He was also aware of three troubling facts. They were four miles away from the nearest road. They had no medical supplies. And if a bear were to go rogue and attack someone, they had no weapons. But people wanted bears, so the show went on. A few park rangers were holding an open Q&A session, and a man named George Ostrom stood up and said he was speaking in capacity as president of the local wildlife federation. He asked the question, is it true that you allowed the concessionaire to feed grizzlies at Granite Park? The ranger said it was not true and that the law was enforced. So George Ostom asked another question. Well then, tell me how many people have been arrested in the last 10 years for feeding bears? The ranger said they'd have to check the records. But Ostrom continued and asked if they could give him an educated guess. The ranger said they didn't deal in educated guesses and that they would have to check the files. However, Ostrom said, don't bother looking in the files. I've already looked in your files. In the last 10 years, you've arrested nobody for feeding bears. Nobody, zero. And everybody knows 
that you can see grizzlies any night of the summer by watching the garbage dump at Granite Park. Now what are you going to do about it? The ranger said they would have to look into it and check the facts. The guests continued to pour in over the summer with the chalet becoming so packed people had to sleep on the floor in sleeping bags. The bears were enjoying the extra scraps and the people were enjoying the bears. Tom continued dumping the slop out for the bears, but on some level he seemed to realize he was playing with fire. He lectured anyone who planned to sleep outside at the nearby campsite at how grizzlies could be unpredictable. And whenever hikers showed up to the chalet without bear bells, he made them homemade bear bells out of tin cans. He also yelled at some of the women when he learned that they used the trail after dark to visit their boyfriends who were constructing a nearby cabin. The problem was the grizzlies used the same trail and Tom yelled at them and lectured them multiple times, but it didn't really seem to make a difference. The bears continued to visit the dump behind the chalet, most notably the bears named number one and number two. Number one was bigger, a silver tip bear with dark brown fur, estimated to be about 500 pounds. Number two was seemingly an older bear with more matted patchy coat. It was smaller and had long claws. Due to number one being a bigger, healthier looking bear, the spectators considered him the hero and number two was considered the villain. Strangely enough though, when the bears did start to snarl at each other or even get into a fight, it was usually number one, the bigger, healthier bear that was the one that backed down first and let the sketchy bear eat. As time went on, both bears didn't seem to mind all the flashlights shining down on them from the chalet. The big crowd of people in close proximity didn't seem to phase the bears at all. In mid-August, the park was flooded with guests and the park was also experiencing a large amount of forest fires due to the heat, dryness and lightning strikes and the rangers were stretched pretty thin. A young 22 year old ranger named Joan Devereaux led a group of bird watchers up to the chalet. It was a 7.6 mile trail from Logan Pass to Granite Park. This was Joan's first guided tour. She was being broken in as all the other available rangers were busy fighting forest fires. Joan's group had 36 hikers in total with a max age of about 65 and the youngest being a nine month old baby. Apparently Joan had heard stories about the feeding of the bears at Granite Park Chalet. Actually, it was a topic that came up almost every time she spoke with one of the other rangers. Joan and her group arrived at the chalet a little after noon and bumped into the Kleins, a couple who had hiked up separately. They asked her if she knew where the overnight camping area was. She told them it was a little down the hill and asked, did you guys bring your grizzly repellent? The question startled the two, but Joan told them while grizzlies were sometimes seen around the chalet, people did use the campsite and they were welcome to do so also. But the question about the grizzlies caused the clients to argue and for a while they didn't know what to do. The chalet was packed and they would have to pay $12.50 each just to sleep on the floor. To put that in context, the $25 total in 1967 would be about $230 today. They didn't know what to do really until they met Don Gullett. He was planning to sleep outdoors too, not at the campgrounds, but beside the cabin that was constructed. It was a few hundred yards from the campsite and a bit more away from the trail that the grizzly used. So the clients and Don found a nice spot to set up camp. On their way, they met another young couple, Roy and Julie. Roy and Julie were heading for the campsite. As the group spoke, the conversation turned to the grizzlies but Roy and Julie just laughed it off. They'd heard about the bears when they got to the area, but they knew that wild animals usually stay away from humans. And they do. Usually. Later that night, Joan was sitting in the common area of the chalet when one of the staff yelled excitedly, a bear is coming. The phrase that signaled to all the eager guests that the show was about to begin. Joan wasn't a specialist in bears, but as a naturalist, she was very unsettled about what she saw. As far as she was concerned, bears and people shouldn't be this close. And indeed, the many conversations she had with the other rangers came to the same conclusion. They all thought that sooner or later, something would happen. Sooner or later, something would have to give. Even people who weren't naturalists found the practice disturbing. A priest named Tom Connolly and his friend Steve Pierre were disgusted by the practice and retired early. Steve Pierre in particular thought the practice was crazy. He was a Native American from the Spokane Reservation and as a child, Steve Pierre's tribal elders had taught him about grizzly bears and they were lessons he never forgot. Later that night after the show had ended, Dr. John Lipinski and his wife Anne were lying in bed half asleep. 
in the bed they had booked in the chalet. When Anne heard a noise from outside, at first John thought she was just dreaming, but then he heard the noise too. They sent their daughter downstairs to find Tom Walton, and she brought him up to John and Anne. At first, Tom also thought maybe the Lipinskis were just dreaming or heard something benign, but the Lipinskis insisted, so the three of them went out onto the balcony. Tom asked them which direction the noise had come from. They pointed down the trail and asked Tom what was down that way. Tom stared out into the darkness. The campsite, he replied. John Lipinski yelled out into the darkness, Is everything okay out there? And a voice came back. No. Well, what's the trouble, he asked. Then a one-word response. Bear. Roy and Julie, the young couple who decided to stay at the campsite, slept outside in the sleeping bags under the stars. They didn't have much trouble falling asleep. But later into the night, Roy woke up and heard Julie whisper, Play dead. The next thing Roy knew, he could hear heavy breathing of a large animal near him, a big grizzly. In the next instant, Roy had been thrown out of a sleeping bag about six feet away onto his face. The bear then jumped onto his back and bit him on the shoulder. The breath was the most horrible stench he had ever smelled. The bear was biting him on his back, his arm, his legs. The bear was large and strong and Roy knew he couldn't fight the bear off, so he did the only thing he could think, what he had been told to do. He played dead and struggled as hard as he could not to make noise as the bear bit into him. But eventually, it left him alone and went for Julie. Roy heard the bear start to bite Julie. It seemed like she was able to stay quiet for a long time, but then she started screaming and yelling, and the bear picked her up, and as she continued to scream, the bear carried her down the mountain. Roy got up and wanted to pursue, but he was injured and bleeding. He realized he couldn't move his left arm. Injured in darkness, he ran and got help. He got to the cabin and woke up Don Gullet. He was in shock and kept repeating, the girl, we have to get the girl. Don wrapped him in his sleeping bag and climbed on top of the cabin to signal the chalet. This is when the Kleins also woke up, and Rob Klein yelled up to the chalet about the bear. Others in the chalet woke up and prepared to go down. Joan was the only park official, so she would lead the group. Father Tom Connolly woke up his friend Steve Pierre and asked him to help. There was now a group of about six ready to go down, but they didn't have any weapons, so Steve Pierre had an idea. He remembered what elders had told him about bears and thought there was only one thing that could scare a crazed animal. Fire. He had noticed a galvanized wash tub earlier. They filled it with firewood and lit it. They tied some baling wire to the handles and dragged the fire tub as they went down towards the cabin area. Roy was still wrapped in the sleeping bag and losing blood and he kept pleading to everyone, please go after Julie, find Julie. I remember him saying, please find Julie, please find Julie. He said, don't worry about me. Please find Julie. They brought a coil spring bed frame from the chalet and carried Roy back up the hill. They laid him out on a dining room table. Luckily, there were three doctors, with Dr. Lipinski being a surgeon. As I previously said, they didn't really have any medical supplies in the chalet, but what they did have was a first aid kit from the Kleins. Joan got on the radio and eventually was able to radio for help and for medical supplies to be flown in. Another ranger was also coming and he was bringing a gun a 300 Winchester Magnum. But before they could get to the chalet, there was a difficult conversation happening. What about Julie? The doctors were doing what they could with Roy, but he was already in bad shape and had lost a lot of blood. Julie, wherever she was, was probably in a lot worse shape. Some of the group thought they should go find her right now, and Roy was pleading with them to do so. But the problem was, they only had the fire and some flashlights that were already running out of battery and at least one rogue grizzly was out there, in the dark. Was it worth risking another attack? It was up to Joan as she was the only park ranger. She had to make the tough decision. The young 22-year-old decided they would wait for help to arrive. In the meantime, she decided they had to get an area ready for the helicopter to land. They made four fires to signal an area. It was going to be difficult as the helicopter would have to fly through a dark night. Not an easy thing to do in 1967 without any kind of night vision. Fortunately, there was a pretty great pilot standing by, John Westover. He was considered an extraordinary pilot and had been flying since he was a teenager. 
He was a Vietnam veteran. He piloted helicopters in combat missions and advanced to the position of personal pilot of the commanding general. Sitting next to him as he flew was veteran ranger, Ranger Bunny. He did his best to read the maps and guide John Westover. The only light they had was the red glow from the instruments. They had no night vision and the only way they could tell there was a mountain in front of them was because there would be a patch on the horizon where the stars disappeared. Somehow, they managed to get to the chalet and saw the fires marking the landing zone. Below, people were shining flashlights on the ground to help them land. When they did, they gave the medical supplies to the doctors. Roy was carried to the chopper and was flown out into the night and Bunny took his rifle and rounded up a few others. It was time to get Julie. They brought the fire pit and they went searching. Steve Pierre took the lead, searching for any indication of what direction the bear went. It was difficult to search in the dark and tensions were high. Every noise in the forest, a potential grizzly in the shadows. Eventually, Steve found some blood droplets and led the men in the right direction. They continued to search through the dark for a while longer, calling out her name and hoping they weren't attracting more grizzlies. A faint whimper came from the darkness. It hurts. They found Julie. She lay with her clothes ripped off on her stomach, barely moving. Severe wounds marked her body, with puncture wounds in her upper back and lungs, all from the bear that had carried her here. Steve took off his jacket and beckoned the other men to join him, and together they wrapped their coats over Julie. Father Connolly retraced his steps alone in the dark to get another bed spring from the cabin. Using the bed frame, they transported Julie back up the hill. During the ascent, Julie regained consciousness and, gripped by fear, implored someone to hold her hand. Father Connolly held her hand. In hushed tones, he tried to reassure her, emphasizing the assistance of the doctors and the protective gaze of God. As they reached the chalet, doctors awaited and Joan had hastily converted the dining room into an impromptu emergency room for Julie's care. Julie, on the brink of death, had lost a substantial amount of blood and was barely breathing. The team of three doctors led by John Lipinski, along with his wife Anne, a nurse, and their daughter Teresa, worked to save her. Despite their efforts, it became evident that too much time and blood had been lost. Dr. Lipinski exchanged glances with Father Connolly. He shook his head. Father Connolly administered last rites after baptizing Julie with water. As they prayed the Lord's Prayer together, Julie's weakening grip signaled the inevitable. At 1.13 a.m. on Sunday, August 13th, 1967, Julie became the first fatality caused by a bear attack in Glacier National Park's 57-year history. In the late 1960s, a statistician attempted to crunch the numbers to determine what were the odds of a grizzly killing someone in the park in one night and determined that it was one million to one. He then tried to determine what were the odds of two kills taking place at the same night and the odds of two happening in the same night in the park were one trillion to one. The day before, five young park employees decided to go camping for the weekend. There was Paul Dunn, brothers Ray and Ron Nozick, and their girlfriends, Denise Huckle and Michelle Coons. They hiked up to Trout Lake, a spot that had been frequented by hundreds of people, and trash was scattered all around. Campers would often leave behind garbage and food that they didn't want to have to carry out. The area around Trout Lake was already a popular destination for bears due to the lake and all the berry bushes, but all the extra food made it even more appealing in particular to a certain female grizzly who had bothered people before at Kelly's camp earlier in the summer. When the five arrived, they were warned by two hikers that there was a lot of bear activity, but they didn't worry about it too much at the time. A few went over to fish while others cooked some hot dogs. The sun began to set and Michelle Kuhn sat on a stump and watched the others by the lake. Then she saw something lumber out of the woods. She yelled, here comes a bear. It was around 8 p.m. A big grizzly invaded their campsite as they had prepared hot dogs and fresh fish. The campers fled and from a distance they watched the bear devour their dinner and make off with a backpack. They relocated closer to the beach. They built a big fire and tried to make a barrier with logs. They wondered if they should leave but it was getting close to dark and they would have to go back through all the berry patch. A thick area of brush that could be concealing multiple grizzlies. They decided their best bet was to stay. Around 4.30 a.m., 
The grizzly returned to the camp. It sniffed around, damaging a sleeping bag and tearing a sweatshirt. The campers, one by one, scrambled up the trees, except for Michelle, who was trying to play dead, as the bear was right beside her. The others urged Michelle Coons to join them in the trees, and she might have. Unfortunately, the bear attacked her. She screamed, he's got my arm, and she started yelling, I'm dead, I'm dead. The bear picked her up in the sleeping bag and dragged her away into the dark. After an hour and a half in the trees, the group ran to the nearest ranger station. Seasonal rangers Landa and Gildart were there. At first, they thought the campers were talking about the Granite Park chalet mauling, but they soon realized the impossible had happened. A completely different attack had occurred on the same night. The group anxiously recounted the last sighting of Michelle Coons, witnessing her being dragged up the mountain by a grizzly bear in her sleeping bag. Rangers, along with some of the boys from the group, followed a disturbing trail marked by a dark slope. The ranger, Leonard Landa, standing about 15 or 20 feet away from the others, exclaimed, Here she is. Discovering her, he was hit with shock, realizing the extent of her mutilation by the bear. Ranger Gildart, particularly recalling the look on Ron Nozick's face, noted his evident date of shock, knowing the two were good friends and understanding the gravity of the situation. The victims had been found, but the killer grizzlies were still out there. Following the attacks, Ron Gildart and Leonard Landa set out to find the responsible bear at Trout Lake. It took some time and after a day of searching, they stayed in a nearby cabin. Gildart, stepping out of the patrol cabin at 4 a.m., spotted the bear and urgently called for Landa with a gun. The bear had no fear of Gildart and continued towards him. A few minutes later, the bear charged at both of them, prompting them to open fire and successfully kill it. A forensic investigator arrived to examine the bear, using a large knife to cut its stomach open. A significant amount of blonde hair emerged from the bear's stomach during the examination. There was also dry blood on the bear's paws. They were fairly certain this was the bear that was responsible for killing Michelle Coons. The bear had glass in its molars, suggesting it was in constant pain and probably pretty angry about it. How did a bear in the middle of a national park have glass in its mouth? The garbage issue extended beyond Granite Park, affecting campsites throughout Glacier due to visitors neglecting proper waste disposal. Trout Lake in particular suffered from this problem, prompting Ranger Gildart to clean up 17 bags of garbage after the tragic events. And what about the bear at the chalet? The day after the attacks, four men hiked up to the chalet, one wildlife naturalist and three rangers with high-powered rifles. Robert Waspin was basically in charge of the bear killing group. The four men arrived at the chalet around noon and had a quick lunch. Many of the staff had red eyes from a sleepless night, much of which was filled with crying. Tom Walton met the men and spoke to Robert Waspin about the bear situation. Walton explained that there were two bears that frequented the chalet and told him about number one and number two. By 8 p.m., all five of them were outside, the rangers aiming their rifles towards the dump area where they had left bait with extra food. Tom and the naturalist had torches ready to shine. It wasn't until a little after 10 that the first bear showed up. It was number one, the bigger silver tip. Tom and the naturalist shone their lights. Wassum whispered to the others, one, two, three. The three men fired at the bear and the bear fell to the ground. And then it was hit by another volley of bullets. The bear twitched and thrashed in agony for a moment, but then stopped moving. Number one was dead. Fifteen minutes later, they heard snorting approaching. Number two, Walton whispered. They waited until the bear got closer, and again the lights came on and shone down on the bear. Then the three count, and the bear was slammed with bullets. Number two was dead. That's it? Wassam asked. That's it, Walton replied. They went over to examine the bears. It turned out both were female. Number one was 350 pounds, and number two was about 100 pounds lighter. The biologist opened the stomachs to look for any strips of cloth or skin or human hair, but all he found were leaves and berries, and there was no blood on the bear's claws. It began to dawn on the men that maybe... A tall red-haired man named Dave Shea had arrived the next day. He was considered to be Wassum's assistant. The ranger showed him how the bear bait was gone, and Dave Shea, who had visited the chalet a week before, said, It was probably the sow and her cubs. The rangers didn't understand. Walton had assured them it was only number one and number two, but Dave explained to them that late at night, 
After number one and number two had their showdowns, after everyone went to bed, another bear and her cubs came to the dump to feast. The firing squad waited outside again on the second night. For a long time, no bears showed up, and everyone apart from Dave went to bed. A little after 1 a.m., he heard something coming. He woke up the others and they went outside and waited. A large shadow lumbered into the dump. Flashlights went on and a shocked bear turned and roared at her cubs. Then she was shot and killed. Upon examining this bear, they found blood on her claws and a pad hung loose from one of her hind paws. The naturalist realized the injury probably left the bear in constant pain. The cubs seemed to have gotten away, but the next day, the rangers saw them and fired. The cubs ran off, but a trail of blood indicated at least one of them had been injured. Let's talk a bit about the journalist George Ostrom, the man who questioned and grilled the rangers before about feeding at Granite Park. He woke up on August 13th and heard the news, and when he did, he said to his wife, My God, it happened, just the way we thought it would. He called the park service and asked for news, but they weren't ready to talk about it. He asked if he could come up and examine things for himself, but was told the trails were closed, even to the press. As the news spread through the town, theories were beginning to emerge, with some saying lightning strikes drove the bears mad. Ostrom called the park service for days and days, but kept getting the same non-answers. Finally, enraged, he called the park service and said he was going up to Granite Park with or without permission. And when the park told him that the trails were closed, he responded that he was going to open them. When he got to the chalet, a ranger met him and told him he could take photographs of the one bear at the dump, but the other bears, so number one and number two, who had been dragged down the hill, weren't to be photographed. Ostrom asked, why not? They replied, we don't want any publicity on it. This annoyed Ostrom and he said, it's none of your business what you get publicity on and what you don't. This is my park as much as it is yours and I'm taking the pictures. As he went down to photograph the bears, he bumped into more rangers with rifles and asked them what they were doing. They told him they were trying to hunt down the cubs. Ostrom asked why, and they told him that the cubs wouldn't survive the winter, to which Ostrom replied that he'd read everything he could on grizzly bears, and that a lot of people think a cub has a chance to make it, and that two cubs together had an even better chance. Then one ranger said there was another reason. Those cubs were trained to eat at the dump, if they are not killed, they'll keep coming back to the garbage. Now this really infuriated Ostrom. So much so that he pulled out a knife and threw it into the ground yelling, the cubs won't come back to the garbage if there isn't garbage to come back to. It's that goddamn simple. These are little cubs, little guys. Uh, and uh, it always come to blows, came to blows a couple of times. I, I uh, was mad enough to punch somebody. In the end though, the cubs were killed. About a year later, a report came out about what happened, and more importantly, why it happened. The report did briefly mention the feeding of the bears, but it was brief, and it also said that lightning strikes, atmospheric pressure, the girls' cosmetics, among other things, may have caused the bears to attack. Uh, we do not have any theory at the present time as to what prompted these two killings so close together. But thankfully, over time, the rules about feeding bears became more strict. You can still stay at Granite Park Chalet today, but on their website it says they have a pack-in, pack-out policy with food, so you're not allowed to leave any garbage at the chalet at all. In fact, that seems to be the park's policy overall, with all the dumps in the park eliminated. Rangers have issued many tickets for visitors trying to feed bears, and have even kicked people out if they have campsites that are too untidy. Trails are closed whenever a grizzly are close by, bear safety warnings were displayed all around the park, and new stricter rules were established for food storage. A permit system was also introduced, restricting campers' numbers and mandating designated campsites located at a distance from cooking areas. While it's commendable that these changes have been implemented, it's regrettable sometimes that it takes a tragic event to spur necessary action. These incidents could have been avoided, as Jack Olson said in the book, The Night of the Grizzlies, it is pure coincidence indeed that two grizzlies chose a few hours of a single night to take two victims who had much in common. But it is no coincidence at all that the year in which this happened was 1967 and the place Glacier Park. In reflecting on stories like this one, it underscores the delicate balance between respecting and fearing nature. This example suggests that while people may not inherently fear grizzlies, which is fine, 
a lack of respect for these creatures can ultimately instill a justified sense of fear. While I haven't encountered any of the North American grizzlies personally, I've explored parks with brown bears, and it seems that as long as you follow the guidelines, you should be perfectly fine. I kind of think of it like this. Fearing nature is like wanting really badly to visit a national park, but refraining from doing so just because you're scared of encountering a bear, which in my view doesn't really make that much sense. On the other hand, however, respecting nature involves acknowledging that while wild animals typically steer clear, adopting precautions and following the guidelines to minimize potential encounters is probably a good choice. You don't have to fear nature, but you do have to respect it. Because if you don't, there could be dire consequences. If not for you, then for someone else. Thank you to all my patrons, thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great day.